What's a kitchen party? Uh, it's really sort of a natural thing that happens here. People gather in, in could be in a living room or a kitchen, wherever, and, and uh, it, just music and conversation and dance, whatever happens. It's just basically a, a get together, really. Um, do you have any memories of particular ones from when you were a, a child? Ones that stick out for you? Oh, yeah. My my folks were, um, they loved music, uh, in particular Celtic music. Um, and uh, this community where I'm from here in, in Cape Breton, uh, Inverness County, well, Cape Breton Island in particular, um, is rich in Celtic music, fiddle music. So I grew up around uh, fiddle music. Uh, my next door neighbor was um, uh, Dan Rory McDonald, who was uh, long gone. Was it the seventies or eighties? He died probably the seventies. And but he was the uncle of John Allen Cameron. Do you remember John Allen? Cameron? I do. Yes. And basically, uh, John Allen's mom and Dan R lived right across the road from us. So, you know, Dan R would come over and play music with my brother, John Morris. That was any time of the day. John Morris played, um, played uh, fiddle, uh, piano, corded form on, on piano at that time. But my parents uh, would have people over, fiddlers come over to the house. It was a pretty uh, common thing to do. And we would entertain, they would entertain us. It was just basically a get together. Right. Did you, I guess, because you were always surrounded by music, did you know that that's what you wanted to do from a very young age or did it come later? Um, well, it was, music was just always there. There was a, really literally uh, across our yard fence was the dance hall. And that's where they, it's still there, the Marble Community Hall, is it St. Mary's Hall, they call it. But um, that's where they had all of the weddings and, and uh, community events. That was a gathering place. So um there was you know when i was growing up there in the 60s and 70s even into the 80s um there was a lot of music that that uh came through and it wasn't just celtic music but there were fiddle dances there uh and rock and country everything sort of came through there and um but when i was a kid uh i just grew up around music and my family had a band and uh I used to open for the band when I was a kid, singing Stomp and Tom Connor songs, speaking of Prince Edward Island. That's very fun. And John Denver songs and whatever songs. And uh, my sister, my younger sisters uh, and I would open for the uh, Rankin Band at, at variety concerts and things like that. And uh, eventually I just didn't want to do that anymore. And um, I, I took about a year off and I was about 12 years old and I, um, uh, I was asked if I wanted to be the drummer in the band. So um, that's, I loved playing the drums when I was a kid because I didn't have to be uh, out in front of an audience. I was just sitting back uh, watching everything. So we, we, I was playing for dances when I was that age, like adult dances. <laughs> and uh, I think at some point, I, yeah, for a while there in the group, uh, Geraldine, my oldest sister, was played piano. My brother David played guitar. John Morris played bass, fiddle. Uh, I played drums, and Raylene uh, was did the bulk of the singing. She did all of the singing, and then Cookie joined probably a year after I did. And we were just really kids, but we were all underage at that time, playing for uh, adult uh, events, dances we called them, square dances. And um, but I. I I didn't really get the music bug for playing in front of people. I started when I was a teenager, uh, I started playing guitar and singing songs and uh, and um, wanted to write songs, but really didn't have anything to write about until I was uh, in my late teens, you know, until I started getting out in the world. And uh, but that's when I got the bug was in my my. Uh, you know, 16, 17, 18. And then it was, I was probably about 19, 20. And um, I I just, uh, I'd gone to art school, uh, NASCAD in Halifax, and mm -hmm. I wanted to be a visual artist. So I thought I would uh, uh, make, uh, uh, support my art by playing music at taverns and things like that. Cause I'd <laughs> done all kinds of that stuff when I was a kid. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, and then it was about 1988, um, the Rankins, uh, the formation that everybody knew across Canada, eventually, the, all those members, uh, we started um, playing, you know, uh, festivals and making records, and it just snowballed from there. And I was sort of playing drums and singing a couple of tunes, you know, during the, the sets. And then eventually I started just doing uh, singing full time. We we were able to hire a drummer eventually, but I would run from the drums to uh, to the guitar and sing and then run back to the drums. <laughs> it was fun. I, I enjoyed it. Do you miss playing the drums? You know what? I do. I'm, I It was my first real instrument, you know, besides vocal. And uh, I still have my old Ludwig kit from those days. It's in the basement. And it's in their cases that, uh, yeah, I do miss drums once in a while and not very often. I, you know, but I haven't lost it. You always have it. But, you know, I was ba I wasn't like a professional studio drummer. I was the, the timekeeper. And actually, I have a new record coming out this fall. It's called Harvest Highway. It's named after a highway in Nova Scotia that runs from uh, Halifax to Yarmouth. I think it's south. Is it? Yeah, I guess so. Um, and uh, I play three or four tracks on piano on that record. Which That'll is, be fun. Yeah, it was the first to be. I actually play a bit of Wurlitzer, which I'd never before played. It's the same as a piano, but the action is different. It's a weird instrument. Mm -hmm. um, but I play that on one track and uh, keys on three tracks, which is, yeah, I'd never done that before. I think there was one record I made maybe 10 years ago that I played a little bit of piano, but not much. But this is, I'm actually playing and singing at the same time, which is really cool. Is that the first time you've ever done that? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it was um, a challenge for me because yeah. I'd never done it before. And with guitar, it's much different because, you know, I've played guitar so much that I can, don't have to think about it as much recording. And with piano, it's like, you know, there's a lot more going on in front of you, you know, when, when you're playing and singing at the same time. So, yeah, it was fun. I uh, It was interesting because I didn't, I only owned an electric keyboard in my house and I wasn't playing it that much. I grew up with a with an upright piano in the Rankin household. But uh, about a month before I started um, making the record, um somebody uh, literally a keyboard literally landed in my lap a big grand piano do you don't hear that too often <laughs> not really <laughs> somebody need was um, downsizing and they needed uh, to store their piano so uh i got this big grand piano which is it's just basically on loan i'm storing it but so i started playing piano every day and i'd cut my finger so i wasn't really able to play guitar so i played piano and all these tunes that i was working on for the record i was um, you know working on I played some of them just on piano so so uh there's like four of them i ended up playing uh keyboard on did you find it difficult i do you find it difficult going from gu guitar to piano because you both hands are doing something when you're playing guitar but when you're playing piano yeah. they're doing something completely different and it's sort of counterintuitive yeah, everything's right there in front of you. I'm definitely, you know, I'm a, a basic piano player. I can make my way around on it pretty well. But um, to for me, it was a challenge to sing and play piano and get everything right, you know. Uh, so, but I did rehearse at home with with this nice big grand piano. And then I recorded uh, at the studio on a big grand and, a, and an old upright. Do you record, where do you record your album? Or your new album? My right? last two records, this is my second record I did uh, in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia right. uh, at Joel Plaskett's studio. He produced oh, right. my uh, this record, which is going to be released this fall. And uh, one I made, I can't believe it's five years ago when I moved back from Nashville uh, called Moving East. Yeah. But it was, and these are the first full length records uh, that I've actually made in Nova Scotia. I'd never made a record here besides the odd track here and there but that was it rankin's uh the rankin family and my solo records i always basically followed a producer wherever they were working right. i would go to them so and work in that environment so but this was uh the i moved back from now i was in nashville for about seven and a half years and moved back in 2017 
and uh, wanted to make a record, like a, a rootsy East Coast style record. And um, I contacted Joel Plaskett and we made it at his studio there, which is, a, it's a great studio. It's an old uh, building where um, they stored, it was a furrier building where they stored fur coats. So it's just this big room and it's got cork in the wall. So it's perfect for recording. And um, Joel likes to record on uh, analog, you know, tape and uh, use vintage mics and things like that. So that was a lot of fun. So I really enjoyed that process. What do you miss about Nashville? Nashville, when we moved, I'd been going to Nashville since uh, the mid nineties to make records. And then I was going back and forth to write songs with people. And uh, we moved down in 2010 and the city really changed. It's really a different city than it was when I, when we moved there and when I first started going there. Um, but it was a great place for me. It's still a great place, probably the best in the world for musicians. You know, there's, there's so many songwriters and mus music of all uh, different genres there. It's remarkable. And uh, it's an easy place to meet people, you know. So really? I, I miss that part of it. And the weather, the winters were mild. Yeah. You know, the Canadian winters tend to drag on five months too long. So, um, What made you decide to come back to Nova Scotia? Well, we never re intended to stay as long as we did. We it was we were just going there for a change of scenery, and then, you know, a year turned into two years, and then um, it was uh, next thing you know, it was seven and a half years. And we moved there when our kids were quite young. It was easy to move them, you know, and then they they started going to school there. And um, I wanted to move back to Nova Scotia, Canada. I'm a Canadian, and I I, uh, I wanted our kids to grow up Canadian. Um, my wife is originally from New York. So our kids are dual, but uh, I wanted them to know this country and, and this part of the world. I'm curious as to what you listen to. Which artists do you listen to? Uh, I listen to everything, really. I love uh, jazz, um, classical. I listen to a lot of classical in the background, CBC all the time. But um, I just have a wide um, uh, range of music everything that's good you know I like excuse me um, I like world music you know any kind of ethnic music from any place if it has if it's good music I like to listen to it but I generally go back to uh, you know singer songwriters I'm all over the map I, I've always have been I, I, I grew up in a house where we had a very eclectic record collection and you know probably the first music that I ever heard in my life was probably Cape Breton fiddle music. And that was in our household constantly. And uh, I knew that very early on, though, I wasn't going to be a, a fiddler. And uh, it wasn't until my teens that I just started writing and thinking about writing songs. And then probably when I was 19 or something, 19, I hit on, you know, uh, I started, I wrote something that I thought was, you know, could be played for people. I've never played it for anybody. Oh, okay. Let's see. <laughs> Are we about to get a free preview here? <laughs> no, but it was then I just, because I, I started traveling. I went to Europe with a backpack and I uh, just started seeing the world, you know, other my own back, you know, backyard. And uh, uh, I was, it, something clicked in me and I just started writing uh, things about songs that about, about what I was seeing and learning to write songs, teaching myself to write songs. And then, you know, eventually I came home and started writing about my environment in, in Nova Scotia and Cape Breton. And, and I come from a, um, a storytelling background. People, you know, it's this part of the culture here to tell stories and, and talk about events and history. And um, that made its way into my songwriting and you can hear that all over the Rankin family records and my records yeah and this last couple of records are I've really gone back to that you know talking about um what I know and stories and people you know, that you know from my uh childhood and my uh my life here mm -hmm. in um in an interview that I listened to uh yesterday I um you said that uh, there are so many tragedies in this part of the world. Does that influence the way that you write? Well, uh, you mean an interview with me about, and I'm yes. talking about this part of the world. 
Yeah, it seemed that uh, it seems, you know, um, maybe it's just part of my culture, you know, it's Catholic and part of the entertainment growing up here was going to wakes and funerals. <laughs> so <laughs> I think there's just <laughs> so and um, I consider myself very fortunate. I grew up with, um, you know, an older generation. Most of them are all gone now, you know, but I grew up around people talking about history and, you know, uh, house fires and, and dances and, you know, just, just history and genealogy. And, uh, uh, I was fascinated by that. And, uh, and, and I, uh, wrote about it in songs like Mull River Shuffle and, uh, you know, you hear it on Rankin family records. That's what I'm talking about. So, um, it's just, it's in my bones. So mm -hmm. it's just my roots. It's part of me. So, and there, that's sort of a, a, that's a thing here. You know, people are very, um, uh, in this community and in, in this part of the world, people are very, um, proud of their history and very interested in it. And they like to know where they've, they come from and they like to tell stories about things in the past. And so I think it's very important to know who you are and where you come from and it gives you direction. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious about Fairly Well, because um, I read that it was a song that was almost left off the album, and I'm curious about how that came to pass and how it ended up on the album. Well, there's a kind of a long story behind that song. Um, I We made two records independently as the Rankin family back. We made two of them within a year. There was the Rankin family, which was the first record, and then there was the album Fairly Well, Love. And there was, we didn't have a record company. We were independently distributed. It was really, we were learning about the music business from the ground up, grassroots. But uh, when we were kids growing, playing at these dances, such we played a, a, comp, a mixture of uh, Celtic fiddle music for square dancing. And then we played what we called uh, round dancing music, which was, you know, anything to make people dance. So it could be a Celtic song or a traditional song or, uh, you know, by the end of the night, you were playing old rock and roll. And so when we started making records, uh, that's what we did. We we just said, well, let's put on a record what we grew up doing, which was there was traditional fiddle and piano and then Gaelic singing. And then, you know, I... I came to the band, I was writing songs. And by the time we started making record, I had a whole bunch of songs and I would just give them to the band and we would maybe, well, let's put a country song on the record. And, or, and so uh, when we started touring, uh, all doing festivals everywhere, I would sort of get dismissed by the Celtic uh, Nazis, as we referred to them. <laughs> And, you know, they would just overlook my songs, you know, they're, that's just generic pop or whatever. And so uh, that was the first record. So I said, I'd like to write a, a Celtic ballad because I'd grown up around those melodies and that music. So I wrote a song called Fare Thee Well, Love. And uh, when we were making that record and the process for making a record was everybody would just bring material to the group and we would uh, say, Oh, that's good. And somebody want to sing that. And, and some, all John Morris would have a, an arrangement of Celtic tunes and he would write Celtic music. And uh, uh, we would try to, um, we, what, what, what we did was we um, uh, featured everybody sort of equally on the record in group songs and everybody had like two songs or something. So Cookie and I, by the end of the uh, pre-production for that record, did not have uh, a song. We needed another song. So we decided to do a duet. I had written the song Fare Thee Well, Love. So quickly turned it into a duet. And then by the time it got to uh, being recorded, it was the last song because we needed each each needed the song. It, we, um, it sort of turned into this, the arrangement when we made the record in Toronto, uh, became sort of a Celtic pop tune. And uh, by the time we, uh, and and that record kicked around for a year or so before like maybe 1992, we signed with EMI Canada, you know, because they had to take notice of us because we were selling so many uh, cassette tapes at that time. And we had an, uh, literally our office was on Barrington Street, our 
right across from Sam, the record man. I don't know if you remember Sam, the record. Yeah. There was a big record store and there was a big uh, maritime sex, uh, section in it. And I would, we would literally go over with uh, pallets of uh, cassette tapes and they would just sell them like crazy there. And, uh, and I, I don't know how many we sold independently, but record companies started taking notice. And then we started getting calls from record companies. And then, you know, it turned into this big bidding thing. And Dean Cameron eventually from EMI uh, in Toronto um, signed us and uh, uh, got that, you know, started releasing singles to radio because radio, commercial radio wouldn't touch us before that. And th those records had been out, you know, a number of years. And uh, of course, EMI had the, uh, like all those record companies at the time had the infrastructure to get your music on radio and right across the country. So Fare Thee Well Love was probably the second or third song released off that record. And it went to number one on pop radio back in those days. And it stayed there for several weeks. And uh, a Canadian song hadn't done that in a long time. Um, so it was, there was something happening in the air with, um, with Roots music and with Canadian music. And, um, you know, uh, we just happened to be there at the right time with a good thing. And, and so all of the, you know, we went from playing um, uh, small concert halls to arenas and just touring around the world, which was very cool, but it happened very, very quickly, really. Mm -hmm. Can the audience at the act expect Fairly Well Love as part of the set list? Well, you know that that song was just inducted into the a uh, few years ago, uh, Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame, which was a, a really nice uh, uh, nod of recognition for me. And uh, it's just gone on to have a life of its own. It's re there's, there are um, orchestral arrangements of it, and uh, a lot of people have. Re choirs have recorded it around the world and uh i didn't sing it for a long time um because it was a duet and then uh i started singing and singing it again in concert um just as a, with an acoustic guitar and uh people you know people know that song it's such a it's a very famous song so i you can hear that song to make a long story short <laughs> <laughs> to, get, to get to what you're asking probably i'll sing it it's a it's a hard bugger to sing because it's got such highs and lows in it and i can sing it i wrote it but um i guess that's the way i write and i never was never thinking about performing it live you know when i wrote it, it was, but uh it's a long song too it's over four and a half minutes so when you start it you know it's a long one <laughs> but like, i know oh, i know everybody will enjoy it um yeah I hope what yeah. else what else can can the audience expect from this performance um of yours on on September 23rd well uh musically uh I'll be doing songs from this new record I haven't played in BC in uh, quite a, a while so I'm excited to play these number of shows that I'm playing there and uh I have a following there from the Rankin days and from my solo career and um I'm going to be doing songs from this latest record. Uh, I'm uh, this record. I'm uh, called Harvest Highway. I'm. It's a very East Coast folk rock record. I sing a couple of traditional songs on it, which is very cool for me because I've never done that before. And uh, I'll just do songs from my catalog, going back to the Rankin days, songs that are people are very familiar with and. Um, I'm very grateful to have those songs that people recognize from the 1990s. And uh, the wonderful thing is, is that when we were touring with the Rankins, you know, as the Rankins and making records, uh, the music was a appealed to multi-generational audience. And um, during that, the parents would play music for their little kids. And now those kids are playing that music for their children. So it's, it's still alive out there, which is pretty amazing, you know, without, you know, the Rankins touring it. And I always sing Rankin songs in my set. So there'll be a combination of um, Rankin family songs and my solo songs from the past and now present. <laughs> 